Greetings, welcome to Friday 13th YouTube channel. Today you're going to be watching an interview with a band called Silent Skies. Now Silent Skies are about to release their third album for Napalm Records. It's called Dormant and it's released on the 1st of September. The band have done two previous albums, Satellites in 2020 and the second album, Nectar in 2022. This band features Thomas England from the band Evergreen, who's doing the vocals. It also features keyboard player and pianist Vakram Shankar, who's a fantastic keyboard player and key, uh, pianist. So I'd like to thank Vakram for doing this interview. I'd also like to thank Napalm Records for setting up this interview. So Metal Edge, please enjoy this interview. Take it for what it is. They're, they're a brilliant band. They're writing some fantastic melodic classical music with some great dark elements. Thanks for watching, Metal Edge. Be safe. Hope you're having a nice day. Yep, so far so good. You know, lots of these, but, you know, that's what you sign up for. It's all good. <laughs> what do you think of the backdrop? <laughs> oh, believe it or not, I just noticed that. I'm, <laughs> I'm clearly not the most observant today. Maybe I, I need more tea. So, oh, so that's awesome. You, it looks great that way. So, so where, are you, where are you from originally, my friend? Because you, do you live in America or something? Yeah, yeah, I'm... Um, Currently in North Carolina on the East Coast, I was born and raised in Cleveland, Ohio, and my parents are from India, but I was born and raised in the States, so I'm, for all, all intents and purposes, American. Okay, great, interesting. So I'd like to thank you for doing the interview and welcome to Friday 13th YouTube channel. Have you seen it at all yet? Have you discovered it? Or... No, no, I have not. This is my, this is my first exposure. Okay, well, Friday the 13th has been around now since 1988. It used to be a fanzine back in the 80s. Okay, very cool. So, YouTube channel, website. So, I've, I've been doing this for the last year and a half as a YouTube channel. That is awesome, man. That's that's super cool. I didn't realize there was so much uh, history behind it, but that is yeah. really nice. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if you ever get a chance to pick up a fa fanzine, it's worth some money. If you see it along your way, grab one. Yeah, man. Of course. What what kind of what kind of places are keeping it in stock? Well, I, I don't know because some, I've seen some of them on eBay. People selling them on eBay. Mm. So, okay, you know. But I've I have been to. North That's Carolina. great, though, man. Because I, I love I love fanzines. It's really cool. I I wish that they were that there were more of them in the scene and that and that people were paying more attention to them. Because I think that it's. Just like with music, I think it's really cool to have physical copies of things. I think that, you know, just like when you put down, put the needle on a vinyl record, I think opening up a fanzine or a book or something is just such a special experience. Okay, then. So I'm going to ask you some way more question first, Victor. I'm so you're a keyboard player, piano player. What instrument came first for you and what age was you? Was keyboards first or did you play a drums guitar? I... Started with classical piano when I was five, maybe. So, you know, formal music education in the, especially first in the classical realm, it was a very big part of my upbringing and musical history. And it actually wasn't until I was maybe between 11 and 13 years old, I can't remember exactly when I even listened to rock music, let alone playing it. Um, so I, I was a late bloomer, and I spent the first bunch of years of my music education firmly in classical music, which was very important for me. I, you know, everyone pretty much agrees that, you know, if you learn classical piano, it builds the chops and everything. But more importantly, it, it built a sense of musicality, and I understood how to play music with touch and tone and sensitivity, especially on the quiet, quieter dynamic side which all these years later has become very important in the making of the Silent Skies music. But, you know, when I was a teenager, I exploded in all kinds of different directions into rock and metal and a lot of jazz piano and a lot of electronic music as well. And I picked up the drums first and then the guitar in part of my restless search to play new instruments because I was quite instrument obsessed when... I was in high school and I would say I was regularly playing maybe seven or eight different instruments, just, you know, working my, working up my chops and all of them. And ultimately I settled on being a professional pianist and keyboard player. When I went to conservatory, I got my degree in jazz piano and composition for film. So, you know, I have a lot of this very, I suppose, nerdy background, but 
you know, it's always been married to a love of popular music in a lot of different forms. And so actually Silent Skies is kind of the perfect meeting of the worlds where I can play piano with the sensitivity of my classical upbringing, but I can also bring in a love of all kinds of modern music and combine it with Tom, who is just the quintessential, you know, dark metal frontman, but seeing him in a very different light as well with Silent Skies. So it's, it's been really a very logical culmination of my trajectory so far as a musician. So you grew up, you actually started recording score music for films. Is that did is that the sort of thing you did? Is that what you was doing? I got my I got my degree in doing composition for film, but actually after college I took a bit of a left turn into working with bands and playing keyboards for bands and doing a lot of orchestral work for them and orchestral arrangements and stuff. That kind of became where I spent a lot of time. And it's only been since 2021 that I've actually gone back into visual media together with Tom. Tom and I started doing a lot of scoring for video games. So we've been working with the company Saber Interactive to do a lot of scores for video games. And it's been really, you know, working at quite a high level with a very big company on big franchises. And that's been a wonderful experience and also a little bit full circle. I'm using some of the education that I had picked up during college and then kind of set aside for a while. So as a, as a keyboard player then, which rock or rock inspired you, keyboard players have inspired you? Anything like Joe Hansen Brothers from Ingvar Malmsteen or Felici from the band um, Attention, them sort of people, any of those inspired you? Um, I, I know Joe Hansen, he's, he's, a, he's a great keyboard player. I, I didn't get into Stradivarius or Ingve for a while and, to be honest, I'm not the world's biggest Ingve fan, but Tom right. absolutely worships Ingve as like you know Swedish guitar god. So I won't offend him too much there. <laughs> but yeah, I, I when I started getting into keyboards, I I was listening to a lot of old rock music, and by old I mean like from the Doors onward. So like Ray Manzarek was the big influence for me when I was younger. Um, and uh, Richard Wright from Pink Floyd and all, all that kind of stuff. You know, I I enjoyed keyboard players like Tony Banks um, and Rick Wakeman, but they weren't as big influences on me for whatever reason. I think as far as 70s prog was concerned, I liked Pink Floyd and I loved Rush. And then I, I just, those were the kind of the bands I fixated on. But then as I got a bit older, I got into Dream Theater and Jordan Rudess became a, a very big influence for me as well as Kevin Moore and Derek Shirinian as well great players but Jordan Rudess became one of my early heroes ironic since I don't actually do very much that sounds like Jordan Rudess I think and a lot of what I do is not what people know him for but he's a marvelous piano player which people don't give him credit for he's actually very very good at playing classical piano with sensitivity and touch and I I related to that it's very cool to see a player in, you know, metal or rock or whatever they are, you know, being from this classical background and being comfortable letting his classical music flag, you know, fly high. So I guess as far, purely as far as rock and metal is concerned, those were some of my very strong influences. And then I have a huge litany of keyboard and piano influences outside of rock and metal as well, but... Okay, interesting. So, I mean, Dark Scars, what was you doing before Dark Scars? Did you have any other bands before you got this? Is, is This is a project, isn't it, or is it a band, just to clarify things? Silent Skies is a full-time band. It's it's a, not a side project. Um, we're actually both a, a little bit touchy about that because I think the side project implies a certain amount of, first of all, partial commitment, and second of all, a certain degree of vanity. And this project doesn't come from either. This, this is, you know, a band that we've really dedicated ourselves towards and we believe really strongly in, in what we're doing. But we started Silent Skies in 2017 and our first album came out in 2020. Um, and in 2017, I was just finishing up Conservatory, so I didn't really have any bands at that time. And since then, I Tom introduced me to Nick from Redemption and I joined Redemption as the keyboard player. I put out some albums on a band or one album for, from the band Lux Terminus, which is like my own kind of keyboard trio sort of thing. 
like Emerson, Lake, and Palmer if they existed in 2018 kind of thing. But, you know, I, I pretty much went from that to session work and working with other bands and being a producer and orchestrator and things like that. And since then, I've played with all you know all kinds of artists. I have just done a bunch of shows with Pain of Salvation as their keyboard player. Oh, so, wow, good yeah. band. All, all over the place. Yeah, I've been playing with them since last year. We did a U.S. tour. So, awesome. Well, a lot of fun. Say, playing please with say hello to Nick for me from Redemption. I've known Nick for many years. Mm, right on. Yeah, no, he's a he's a fabulous guy. He's he's a good friend, and you know, we just released an album together. What three, four months ago? I guess in March it came out. Yeah, I reviewed um, the album. Yeah, it's I am the storm. Yeah, I yeah, which, the album. which is a. <laughs> Yeah, that album was was a lot of fun to put together, and that was kind of the the first album I really put my full stamp on as a full keyboard player and also co composer and co producer. So. Okay, so the name lots of Silent, stuff. So, so the name Silent Skies. Who came up with the name? I've noticed it's Silent underscore S and Skies underscore with an S. So how how did what does that mean with the underscore after Silent and the S underscore? The underscore is a stylization. It's it's really not nothing more, you know, thought out than that. It just it it has it makes people ask questions and it kind of you raise the eyebrow and you say, huh, interesting, which is pretty much what what we wanted to do with with the marketing and everything. But the name we had a ton of different names that we were talking about many years ago, and we had a song on the first album called Solitude, which had a phrase that involved the word silence, guys, and. We, we became quite captivated with the idea. I like the idea that in the absence of noise comes reflection, comes thought, comes introspection, and ultimately self-actualization through that process. And so the silent skies in general are kind of like a metaphor for the mind and what happens when you turn off all the clutter and you really sit down and reflect and ask yourself the tough questions. Dormant especially is us holding up a mirror and asking ourselves the tough questions and truly reflecting. And the audience is almost watching us undergo that process, but also hopefully being inspired to undergo the same process themselves. Okay, then. So how did you and Tom hook up then? I mean, obviously, you must have been seeing Evergrey live or is it just the redemption thing? What was it that actually got you guys together? It was a... Facebook Cinderella story, I guess. He, he wrote to me in January 2017, completely out of the blue. I had never spoken to him before. I had never met him. We had zero connection, except for the fact that obviously I knew Evergrey very well. And I had played some Evergrey songs on piano. Like, you know, I used to do a lot of covers on YouTube. So I had played some Evergrey songs on piano. And he had seen those covers and he was. I think he, he understood that we had some kind of kinship, musical kinship from watching those covers. He saw that I understood his music and I understood how he thinks about music and, you know, the mentalities, but also the emotions and the aesthetics and everything. So he reached out to me completely out of the blue. We weren't friends or anything, which is kind of backwards now that I think about it. Like a lot of these sort of projects are friends who come together and decide to make music, but this was backwards. Our friendship developed over the course of years after that. And he introduced me to Nick after that. And I joined Redemption. End of 2017 was when I became the full-time keyboardist for Redemption. But Silent Skies was already in the works at that time. And Silent Skies was the first defining career moment for me that set my trajectory. Because through Silent Skies, I got in touch with so many people so many projects I've done since then have been through that connection or through people who've discovered me through Silence Guys. So that one Facebook message out of the blue in January 2017 has almost defined the subsequent six years, which is a very odd thought when you think about it. Like, what if he had not sent that message? He really had no reason to send that message. We, Like I said, we had no connection, but there was some... He describes it as like there was some element of fate, I suppose, that pulled him towards this and told him, nah, you, you have to send this message. You have to ask this guy to work with you. And apparently he was nervous. I would say no, which is ludicrous to me because I've been an Evergrey fan for like a decade at that point. Obviously, I was going to say yes, but apparently he was nervous. So that actually kind of 
made me feel flattered in a way, I guess. So Silent Net Skies was the only name you had. Nothing, no other names for this uh, this uh, band. No other names that we released under. No, um, we had talked about some other names in the very early stages, but Silent Sky. We've always been Silent Skies as far as the released music is concerned. Okay, so you released your first album in 2020, Satellites. Was that released on AFM Records? Yes, that was our first album, first and last album on AFM. They were had been working with Evergrave for many years, so it was kind of just a, a natural pre-existing connection. But then when Evergrave moved to Napalm Records, we moved with them as well. Okay, so how, what was it like doing the first album? What sort of reaction did you get from the fans with Tom being like in a dark, progressive band and... Not many people know, disrespect to yourself. I didn't know you was until this project came around, or this band, so to say, sorry. So I didn't know anything about this band at all. I didn't know where you came from, your history. How did it, how you guys gel? How did the fans and the press take the first album? What sort of reactions did you get? They loved it. And honestly, we were a bit surprised and apprehensive um, because we, you know, we're making profoundly knock metal music and at least the pre-existing fan base that we were releasing to was Evergrey fans and metal fans and prog fans. So there was no guarantee that they were going to latch on to it. Perhaps the saving grace was that we were kind of, you know, that was kind of our anathema era, so to speak. That album is very heavily influenced by anathema because I was, you know, really, really into anathema at the time. And anathema is a very respected band in prog circles, even though they have a much more kind of like, I don't know, emotional pop thing going on, but they're very respected in prog circles. And we, the guy who mixed two Anathema albums was had mixed that album as well. But, you know, I think people understood what we were trying to do. They understood that we did not have distorted guitars. We did not have double kick drums, but we did have emotion and darkness and intensity of a different sort. And they understood that we were expressing you know, emotions and themes that they were comfortable with and familiar with and liked hearing in their music, just in a slightly different context. And, you know, they've been along with us on the ride ever since, despite the fact that we've taken numerous left turns since then. And I would say we don't sound very much like that first album anymore, but still in a, in a way we do because we'll always be melancholic and we'll always be dark. That kind of thing is never going away, but we love experimenting and being restless and, you know, trying new ways to express ourselves. For me, a lot of new instruments and a lot of new sound textures and concepts and a lot of analog synths and experimentation with different instruments has kind of pushed the boundaries of where we are. But I think people understand the core of what we're doing, which is very gratifying. So was the first album a success for you in the end? Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, I would say it was a success and... Right, you know, we had finished the first album. We were so excited to just dive into the second one. And it's been that way ever since. You know, we finish an album. We're, we're already excited to dive into the next one. We're about to release our third album in nine days. And we already have some songs from our fourth album written. So oh, interesting. we're very restless and very productive because we love this. This is so inspiring for us. So it's not a challenge to, you know, make ourselves write this music. Okay, so the second album, Nepto, was released in 2020, the first album for Napalm Records. How was that a progression from the debut album? How did you see that as a progression? Yeah, I see every album as a progression. Nectar was a step away from the, the bombastic classical side. You know, On the first album, I had used a nine-foot Steinway concert grand, which has a huge, huge sound, very bright and powerful sound. That piano was designed to project over an orchestra with no amplification. So it's a very loud, bright instrument. Since then, we've moved over to using a felted grand piano. It's actually my parents' piano in Cleveland where I learned to play, you know, all those years ago. And I inserted felt strips in between the hammers and the strings. So when you play, the, the hammer goes through a sheet of felt before it hits the string. So it makes a very muted, warm, low dynamic, quiet sound. And that's become one of the defining parts of our sound. And we also have been going into synthesizers a lot more. I'd say the synth work on the first album was fairly rudimentary just because I was pretty new to it. I had not done that much work with synthesis. 
And then on the second album, we grew that component. And now on Dormant, it's just a huge part of what I do. And it's a big obsession. And I have all these toys that I, you know, really explored making this album and worked so much to make that a signature sound. And I think find other ways of expressing myself that weren't quantity of notes. As a prog musician, I suppose, I guess I've made prog music so we'll say i'm a prog musician you get used to playing a lot of notes and you get used to quantity of notes becoming a way that you express yourself which is fine but i wanted to think about other ways that i could push myself and so i started thinking about new sound colors and new textures new ambience new atmosphere and nectar was a step in that direction and then dormant is a leap forward in that direction i would okay. say so the first two albums, did you have any titles for Satellites and Nectar? Any other different titles for those albums? No, I wouldn't say so. I think both of those albums, just that those titles just spoke to what, you know, a certain character and also themes that we were getting at with those albums and just as Dormant does. But it, it is always a little bit of a challenge to pick album titles, at least for me because I feel that the title has to in some way be representative, but it also has to kind of be like a book cover where you don't want to give everything away on the cover. You want people to be provoked to open up and read, but you also want to capture their attention and you want to summarize the themes of the album, but also, you know, not betray everything and not rely on a gimmick to make people, you know, press play. But it, it is quite challenging to have that element of pop and we've always loved these, you know, single word album titles because it's like, you know, a single word provokes more questions than it provides answers. And we love that about music as well, you know, our music included, that I'm much more interested in making my listeners ask questions than providing them answers. Okay, then. So the title for the new album, Dortmund, you've got a new album, I can say it's got 13 songs and it's got three covers. You've got Iron Man, The Trooper. Why did you want to do the troop and what Iron Maiden songs, other ones did you consider doing at the time? I think Iron Maiden was the trooper was by far the primary contender. I, I mean, I like Iron Maiden, but Tom loves Iron Maiden. So if he if if someone else was to if there were to be other choices, it would have come from his mind. But as far as I know, the trooper was always our consideration. And we were we were talking about that cover first when the invasion of Ukraine was, you know, very much foremost on people's minds. So the trooper was a, nat a natural tie-in. With all of the covers, though, our interest was to take songs that don't sound like us, first of all, that have all three of them have very different arrangements to what we do in some way. But they all have this kind of emotional core that we find compelling. And we wanted to strip away all the other layers and rebuild the song in our style with our tendencies and bring that emotional quality to the fore. And specifically with the Trooper, you know, I think I'm I'm just speculating, but I think a lot of our Maiden fans listen to that song and they hear the huge riffs, the fast, you know, galloping pace, Bruce Dickinson's, you know, commanding larger than life delivery. But the lyrics are so sad. Like they are incredibly tragic lyrics if you actually read them. Very emotional. And the way, the way he, that Tom's done it, very emotional. Yeah, because that's how it's written. And the thing is, it's not that Bruce delivers them poorly. He delivers them like a, the god that he is. But you know, it's a it's a delivery that sometimes maybe misleads as to just how sad the actual narrative story is. So just like with all the covers, our goal with the Trooper was to reveal. The way we feel the emotions. I'm not saying that it's the right or wrong way to read anything, but we perceive that song as having a very tragic narrative essence. So we, you know, put our spin on it in that way. Tom delivered it just with such a wonderfully sensitive touch and so so respectful of the original because we respect the hell out of the original. And our, our idea is hopefully to not be, you know, profane or blasphemous to like you know the iron maiden universe it's just we love this song so much and it's such a special song and this is how we see it and 
if we were writing the trooper and if it was our melodies and our lyrics, this is how we would have done it. They've done a fantastic job, by the way. Has Iron Maiden actually heard your version? Do you know? Has anybody of Iron Maiden heard it? I don't believe so. We have we have not heard any reports. Actually, um, the kind of cool moment where I don't know if you saw on social media, but uh, the Iron Maiden guys, at least Steve Harris, watched Evergrey's set at a open air at maybe Hellfest a couple months ago. But they were they watched the show and then you know came up afterwards and were talking to Tom and I was just thinking man if you had said something about the trooper cover but that would have been such an awkward interaction yeah. hey thanks thanks man check out this cover that I did with another band that you have no familiarity with like obviously so, he would never do that but so, so all the songs were as a team effort you and Tom do you write all the music and Tom writes all the lyrics is that how it works it's very collaborative and it's not Tom doing all the vocals and me doing all the music, although it kind of started that way years ago. But at this point, it's very, very collaborative. And we, as soon as we have a very basic, maybe a couple chords and a vibe, we hop on Zoom together and we're working on all aspects of the music together on Zoom. Tom's helping me with arrangement ideas and suggesting maybe different keyboard things I can do. And on this album, more than any other ones, I'm contributing a lot with how we think about vocal melodies and lyrics. I'll suggest vocal melodies. I'll, you know, sing them and demo them out and tweak vocal melodies he's done and make them more effective. And we also work a lot together on lyrics. I think myself being a native English speaker, I think he values the way that I hear lyrics and the way that I would express things. Obviously, I can never come up with lyrics the way that he can. But we do work together very closely to make these things come together. And I think that's part of the Silent Skies thing. I mean, I guess the Silent Skies magic, if you want to put it that way, is that we start the songs together and we grow the songs together. And vocals are always there and music is always there. A lot of metal bands write the music and throw the vocals on top. So that's a perfectly valid way to do it. But there's a bit of a disconnect between the music and the vocal sometimes because they weren't conceived of together at the outset. But Silent Skies always starts with the two together at the outset. So when we grow things, we're always thinking of the vocals as we write the music and vice versa. Okay. So, so how, long, how long did it yeah, take to it record this album? How long did it take to record the album? This one took uh, longer than Nectar for sure. Nectar took four to five months from start to finish. And this one took... I'm going to guess nine months. Um, but part of the delay, of course, is that we're busy. And, you know, if Tom's going on tour, he went on a very big tour. I think September to October, he played like 40 shows in 43 days or something just absurd. He did some really long tour around that time. So obviously we're not working on Silence Guys during that time. So there are little gaps in the record, so to speak, where, you know, we're, we take detours to do our own thing. But it did take quite a while. Reason being that we set ourselves a really high bar. I would say the songwriting was really quick, but the production and the arrangements and just getting things to the finish line took a while because we were very exacting with every detail. We put so much work into the smallest little details and not being afraid to question ourselves and scrap things and start over because we want it to be as good as possible. So um, how... So was it yourself that produced the album? You were Tom, did you do the album between you or did you have somebody else involved? We self-produced and I mixed the album as well. So okay. the only external work we had in that regard was Jacob Hansen did a mastering job. Uh, it's good produ- good guy, man. So so the album cover is very progressive, isn't it? Who came up with the artwork for this album? The artwork's a painting by Matthias Noren. Um, he's a painter who's... He has a deep history with Evergrey because he did the first few album covers. I think Solitude Dominus Tragedy through Recreation Day, maybe? Uh, yeah, yeah. Don't quote me on that. But he yeah. was way back in the day, he worked with Tom. And he did this painting that we really fell in love with because we felt that it was getting, it was expressing emotions and atmospheres in a very similar way that we were with our music. And we also loved that if you really look closely, there are so many fine, intricate details that make up the whole. 
which is very much how we approach our music. We think about very small, intimate details, but then the overall picture is just this kind of melancholic, relaxing, subtle thing. It's kind of how we felt with his artwork as well. It's very... He did a bunch of paintings. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. So I was going to say, sorry, it's very Mother, mother Nature, isn't it? Mother Earth, from the roots to the trees to the top of the... And that was your Yeah, idea. exactly. Very, 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 very naturalistic, but also thinking about, you know, the dichotomy between nature and the self, also metaphorically speaking, and thinking about the world as a whole and the world within the mind as well, and how you can deconstruct what's going on in here and how you re reflect and look internally to achieve some form of self-actualization. And it has a sort of vaguely Buddhist idea as well but not you know fully tapping into buddhism but just hinting at some of the ways that meditation and self-reflection can help you achieve tranquility which is a vaguely buddhist idea i suppose i mean it's a very the music's very beautifully composed i mean you must have had people say to you i want this song at my wake a funeral has anybody ever approached you and said that yeah, we've had some things like that. We've had some things like uh, weddings as well, which would be a pretty sad wedding. But what do I know? I mean, there, there, are, there are definitely, this is an important point that someone I was talking to recently said that our album was depressive. And I kind of objected to that a little bit because I think it's dark and melancholic, but I think that ultimately we're going for hope and catharsis. We're looking inward to find strength. You know, so I do think that there are songs that would be fitting for a wedding because we have these glimmers of hope in our music. Light Up the Dark would be a very obvious example on the new album of something that would fit a wedding very nicely. I think but it's, it's, you know, it's, all, it's lovely when people want to associate your music with momentous occasions in their life or death, as the case may be. Yeah, I mean, I listen to it and I think your music, of, I want to listen to it, relax when I get home from work and or whatever you do and just relax and just chill out to it. It's that sort of music that just calms your sense of, you know, do you agree with me on that? Yeah, I mean, that's that's fantastic. I mean, if you think about, you know, what I was saying about trying to find inner peace, a lot of the issues that we have in the modern day of finding that inner peace is that there's so much happening. There's so much noise, sensory input, so many obligations. There's always something to do. There's always someone to talk to. Always someone wants a piece of your attention. Always something has to be attended to. And with Dormant, we just really want people to take 50 minutes and just turn it off. Sit down with your relaxing beverage of choice, dim the lights, a lighted incense if you feel so disposed, and just listen and reflect and allow the music to take you to a place where you can reflect and you can, you know, come to some sort of understanding about yourself. Because the reason I think that a lot of us struggle to find that understanding about ourselves is we don't have the space to, we don't have the time to, the world doesn't let us do so with, you know, the amount of crap that it hurls with us, hurls at us all the time. So yeah, the way you put it is, is perfect. Okay, just before we finish. And I have a 2.30 interview, so I just want to let you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to be finishing to very shortly. Um, do you have any, quickly, do you have any favorite songs from the new album before we finish? Yeah, I'd say that there, there are a few signposts that I, that I feel very strongly about for various reasons. I think the song Reset is a very special one lyrically. I think that it just it, it expresses some themes that are just so universal and so many people can relate to that and i'm in i'm roughly half tom's age and you know I, I as a younger person so many people in my age group feel the way that that song expresses lyrics so i think it's an it's an important song culturally speaking i think churches is an important song for me musically because it was just such an exhilarating experience writing that song I remember being on Zoom with Tom, spending a couple hours writing the chorus, and it's just like, I felt like we were tapping into something really special when we were writing that song. And I, I feel that way every time I listen to it. I remember how magical it was to write that song. And then if I was, if I was to pick a couple more, I think The Real Me is special because it just pushes the boundaries in so many different ways. 
There's so many things on that song that we'd never done before. I'm playing eight tracks of mandolin in the end. I never thought I'd play mandolin on anything, much less Silence Guys. But it's all in the, you know, the name of that experimentation and bringing in new characters and pushing the envelope. And then lastly, Light Up the Dark, because of a very particular memory writing that song where I had written the piano part for it and just just solo piano and I sent it to Tom. And the next day we were on Zoom and he played me a minute and a half of vocals, like chorus and verse. And I just sat there like, you know, and there was, we, he finished playing it and there was like a very poignant, like 20 seconds of silence. And I think I just said like, wow, or something. I don't know where those lyrics came from. They are so beautiful and poetic and powerful and like inspired and special. I don't know what he was tapping into to make that happen, but it's like, I will always remember that moment when he played me that first minute and a half and both of us just sat there kind of in awe <laughs> of how powerful that moment was. So, okay, well, I'd like there's to... There's four, but... Like to thank you, Victor, for the interview. Do you have anything to say to the people watching this on YouTube before we finish? Yeah, um, I'd like to say, first of all, thank you for listening to me ramble on and on about this stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's really great to have people so interested in what we do and people from such diverse backgrounds. But that's the beautiful thing about metal is it's such an open and inviting community and rock music as well. Such open-minded listeners who are willing to give weird stuff like us a chance because they understand emotion and atmosphere in a way that is, you know, very special for metal listeners. So thank you very much for listening to me talk and for checking out the album. Hopefully it resonates with you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, Victor, have a nice day, my friend. And I will be in touch with you. Like if you're on Facebook, I'll send you the link with the interviews online. Okay, awesome. Yeah, please do that. Yeah. Thank you, Absolutely. Victor. Have a nice day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right on, man. Thank you. Yeah, you thank too. you. Bye-bye.